All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in with us this month, you know that, well, it's been a jam-packed month with over 60 live events, but one of our big themes has been space exploration. So talking to scientists, to engineers, to astronauts, those who are exploring our solar system and beyond, and of course, looking back down at our planet, because we can learn a ton uh, about our planet uh, from our explorations outside of the atmosphere. So we have another great event uh, in store for you today. Today, we're gonna connect with Dr. Jennifer Heldman. She's a planetary scientist working in the Division of Space Sciences and Astrobiology at NASA's Ames Research Center. She's interested in studying the moon and Mars, as well as our home planet Earth. So her fieldwork has taken her all over the place, the outback of Australia, the Canadian high Arctic, the Atacama uh, Desert, uh, Spitsbergen, the Mojave Desert, Iceland, Antarctica, and more. So when she's looking at Mars, she's looking at recent research and studies of water that's found there, at the moon, looking at ice deposits and how these are gonna be important for future explorations. So I'm gonna bring in Jennifer with us right now. Here we go. Hey, Jennifer, how are we doing today? Great, how are you doing? Good, good. It's great to have you joining us live. We've got a great group of classrooms right across North America hanging out with us. And we're excited to get to know you a little better today. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And thank you to all the students and teachers who are taking time out to talk about space today. This is so great. Um, what I wanted to do is just give you a little overview of what I do at NASA. So I am a planetary scientist. So I study the planets. I study, I like the Earth. I love the Earth. It's the only planet we've ever been on. Um, I also love the moon and I love Mars. So I wanted to show you sort of what goes into my job as a planetary scientist, because maybe some of you are thinking about, well, hey, I like to work at NASA someday. So what, what, what do we do? Um, so what I do is I study the moon and Mars in a few different ways. So one way we do that is we send spacecraft to these other planets and to other moons. So we have multiple spacecraft at Mars right now. Here's a picture of two orbiters. So an orbiter means it's going in a circle around Mars and looking down um, and taking data and taking pictures of the surface and the atmosphere. Um, and I also look at the moon. So there's a few missions we've sent to the moon. One that I think is really cool that we did about 10 years ago um, is called LCROSS, the Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite. And actually I have a model, let's pull this up. I've got a model of LCROSS here. So we did, we were looking for water ice on the moon. At the poles of the moon, we're like, wait, there might be ice there. How can we go tell? So what we did is we launched this rocket to the moon um, and we sent it towards the south pole of the moon. And then there's this little spacecraft at the top that pops off. And this has cameras and all sorts of sensors on it. And what we did is we took this, which is part of the rocket. This is all where the fuel is, basically the gas to get it to go up. Um, and we emptied it all out on our way to the moon. And then we crashed this into the South Pole of the moon, into a very deep, dark crater where we thought it was cold enough where there could be ice. And so what's going to happen if we crash this into the moon? Like what happens if you throw a rock into a big pile of dirt? You make a big mess, right? All that dirt kicks up and, you know, goes up above the ground. And that's exactly what happened. And we took this little spacecraft and we flew it through that cloud of dirt that got, that got kicked up from when this hit it. And lo and behold, we found there was lots of ice there. So that was pretty cool. So we're like, hey, there's ice on the moon. Um, but that tells us in one spot. And now we're like, we gotta go map it out. Where else is it? So now what we're working on at NASA, and I'm working on this mission too, is called VIPER, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. Volatiles is just a fancy science word, basically means ice. So we're gonna take this rover that you see, we're gonna drive it around the south pole of the moon and we're gonna map out where that ice is. And it's got a drill, we're gonna drill down, it's gonna be very cool. So sometimes we work with spacecraft and that's very awesome because we can send these robotic spacecraft um, to other planets and to the moon. Some of the other things I do um, are doing work on Earth so that we can understand other planets and other moons and also understand our own Earth better too. So the way we do this, the terminology is called an Earth analog. So analog just means it's like something else. So we go to places on Earth that are like the moon or that are like Mars, right? We haven't sent any people to Mars yet. Hopefully we will soon. Um, and we have sent 12 people to the surface of the moon. 
um, back in the 1960s and 70s, but we haven't sent anyone since. So it's a lot easier for us to do work on the Earth. So if I wanted to study somewhere that was like Mars, I need to go somewhere that's cold because Mars is really cold. It's further from the sun than the Earth is. Mars is cold and Mars is also very dry. Maybe it had water a long time ago, like billions of years ago, but it's mostly gone now. So Mars is cold and Mars is dry. So if I want to go somewhere cold and dry on Earth, the cold part usually means you need to go near the poles, right? Near the North Pole up in high Canada, near the South Pole in Antarctica, cold places. And dry places usually means you have to go to deserts because deserts are, you know, by definition, they're dry. So we go there for two reasons. Don't read all the words, but we go there to do science. We want to understand, like, how is there water in these places? And, you know, how are mountains built up here? And how do these things work? And we also want to go to learn how to operate our robots and people when we send people to the moon and Mars, when we send astronauts. How are they going to work? We got to test it out on Earth first. So that's what we do. We go to these analog places and test things out. So here's just some pictures showing some of the things um, that I've done before. And I just want to say this is one of the like best parts of my job is that I get to do all these different types of things. Like sometimes I'm in an office like I am today, um, but a lot of times I'm not. So sometimes I'm in Antarctica with a drill. I'm drilling into ice. That's fun. Sometimes I'm at our NASA center um, and with our rovers and we're driving our rovers and testing those out. Sometimes I'm walking around in a spacesuit and we're testing out how astronauts are going to go study rocks when you're like, you know, have a helmet on and gloves and all that. Uh, sometimes I'm in the desert and we have these laboratories that are on wheels so you can drive them around and go to different rock outcrops and such. Um, sometimes I'm in the mission operations center. Right? So we set those up, and in this case, we're operating a rover that was out in the desert, but we're at our NASA center, because that's how you do it when you're on the moon. You can't go to the moon with your rover, but you have to learn how to operate it from on the ground. And then sometimes we're living in, in habitats, because we're going to have to send habitats for people to live in on both the moon and Mars. So how do we design them? How do we use them? What equipment do we need in them? All those types of questions, we can test them out on Earth first. It makes a lot of sense. So I just want to show you some of the pictures of places on Earth that I've gotten to go through my NASA work. And I think this is really cool because we go to these places, you know, not only to learn about the moon and Mars, but in the process, we learn a whole lot about our own planet. You know, how do deserts work? How do cold regions work? You know, what's there? What's living there? Is anything there? Um, and so it gives you a really good appreciation for our own planet. Um, so this is the Atacama Desert. This is in Chile in South America. It looks like Mars. And if you look, there is no trees. There are no shrubs. <laughs> There's not a lot living there. It's very, very dry. And so that's why we go study it. It's very dry like Mars. If we want to look for life on Mars, we need to learn how to do that. And we test it out in places like the Atacama. Another place that looks like Mars is the outback of Australia. Mars is very red um, because there's a lot of iron there. Um, iron oxide is basically like rust. Um, and so you can see this in Australia as well. If you go to the outback, you got some of the same minerals that you see on Mars, same types of rocks. Um, here is a desert a little closer to home in North America. This is Death Valley in California. So you can see these cliff faces. If I took a picture of this and I tried this with my scientist friends um, and I said, what planet is this? Um, they can't tell if it's Mars or if it's Earth because we see these same, these are like gully features where water ran down the sides of these cliffs. You see the same thing on Mars. So we're trying to figure out how are you having liquid water running down the side of cliffs in a desert um, on Earth or on Mars? It's curious. Um, I think we have some friends from Canada with us today. This is up in the high Canadian Arctic. Um, it's called Axel Heiberg Island. If you want to go look it up, it's really far north. Um, and so we're going there to look at, there's this water that's flowing. I mean, the temperatures in the picture on the right where there's liquid water flowing are like minus 60 degrees, right? That's, that's well below freezing. So why isn't all that water frozen solid like a big ice cube? Um, and the answer is because it's very salty. So for those of you that live in the Northeast, um, in the US or even in Canada, like where I'm from, we put salt on the roads in the wintertime because that melts ice. That's what's happening here. There's salty water, so it stays melted. And we think that might be happening on Mars, too. 
Um, here's another really cool place. This is an island north of Norway. It's called Spitsbergen. Um, again, there's some glaciers that are coming down, lots of water and ice activity in these really cold places. Um, and then really awesome is Antarctica. If you ever get a chance to go, you should definitely do it. It's super amazing. So we go to Antarctica. It's really the best Mars-like place because it's the coldest and it's the driest. Now you might think like, wait, isn't Antarctica like fully covered in ice? And most of it is, but there are these very special places called the dry valleys. And you can see I'm standing where the picture where I'm standing on rocks, that's the dry valleys. And it's this very unique area where it's not covered in ice. There's ice underground, but not on the surface. So we go there um, to study the subsurface ice, the ice that's underground, just like there's ice underground on Mars. Um, and then, like I said, sometimes we're in habitats. So we design and we build these habitats and then we go do missions in them and we live in them for you know several weeks at a time. Um, and then we go outside when we go outside, you have to wear a spacesuit because that's what you have to do on Mars. Um, and then we go out and do our science and then we come back inside. There's a lab in the basement or in the bottom level so that you can like do your analysis on your rock samples. Um, and then there's living quarters upstairs. Um, as I mentioned, you know, here I am in a spacesuit taking some notes about this beautiful canyon that we were studying that day. And so this is one of the things that I like about my job is that it's always different. Every day is different uh, because there's just something different depending on what the project is or what needs to get done that day. Um, so sometimes you're in places like this and that's, that's just part of my job. Um, but I also wanted to tell you a little bit about the adventure that goes behind it too, right? Because I think space exploration is really exciting and that translates to what we do on Earth too. So these analog places that I'm showing you all around the globe, they are, they are not the places you go on vacation, right? It's not, there are not flights into international airports. It's not like going to Disneyland, right? So they're very hard to get to because most people don't go there. There's no hotels there. There's no big airports because um, they're, you know, they're extreme environments. So we do all sorts of different things to get to these places. So sometimes, I, and I, and these are all pictures I've taken, I've done all these things. Sometimes we take helicopters um, and land on boats. So this is Spitsbergen, we needed to get, you know, we're on a big boat, we need to get to the land. Best way to do that is you load up in a helicopter, you take off from the boat, you go, do your field work on land and then come back to the boat at the end of the day. Um, here we are, the, you land um, wherever your field site is, take all your science gear out, whatever you're gonna need for the day, um, and then the helicopter leaves and comes back for you later. Um, it's a little more complicated when you go to Antarctica. So to get to the dry valleys, you first, you, there's a, a US base, McMurdo Station in Antarctica. You get all your gear at McMurdo and you load it all up in the helicopter and you're going to be going into the field for about one to two months. Right. So you've got like four to eight weeks of gear you have to bring. So you have to bring your sleeping bags, your tents, your food, your fuel, your science equipment, everything you're going to need because they're going to drop you off um, in remote Antarctica and then they're not going to come back for one to two months. So you better make sure you don't forget anything. Um, sometimes we take smaller boats. We are studying a glacier in this case, which is in the background. So we take small boats so we can go collect samples. Sometimes we're on bigger boats. This is an icebreaker ship. So when you're going around, you know, up in the Arctic, you've got to be able to cut through the ice um, to get to where you need to go. So sometimes we take big boats. Um, sometimes we take small airplanes. This is in the outback of Australia, taking a small plane. Um, so we are mapping out the rocks. So that's pretty fun. If you go far enough north or south, sometimes you're landing on ice and snow, so you add skis to the bottom of your plane, and that's how you get in and out. You find a flat, um, frozen over area, and that becomes your landing strip. Sometimes we take big planes. Here's a C-17 Air Force plane. This is what takes us from New Zealand down to Antarctica, um, and that's really tricky because that's a that's a tough flight, um, and the worst thing that happens is you get a what's called a boomerang. So you start flying from New Zealand and you're, you know, it takes a while. So it's pretty far. Look on it on a globe and you're getting to Antarctica. But if the weather gets bad, if the weather changes while you're in flight, you have to turn around and go back to New Zealand. You got to wait and then try again. Um, so it can be tricky to get to McMurdo. And then I put this in too, because, you know, 
you might think of NASA as like, oh, it's all high tech and it's all fancy things. Like, no, it's actually not all the time. Because sometimes you have, you know, a van that breaks down in the middle of nowhere and you have to be able to fix it. Um, so being able to work with your hands, to be able to actually do things, fix things, that becomes really, really important. And um, having done enough of this analog work, uh, we always we always say that the most important person on a space mission is the mechanic. It's the person who can fix things that break. Um, sometimes we make snowmobiles. So this is how I got to my field site um, up in the Arctic. It's just the easiest way. Everything's covered in snow. You load up and you go. Um, so it's all great. So we go and we do all the go to all these places. But the point is, we're trying to learn something when we get there. So just like in school, if you do an experiment or, or you're, you're you know, writing a paper, it's to convey knowledge. And that's what we do. We go out, we do our field campaigns, we do our field work, then we come home and we think about what it is that we learned and we write that up. So I think that's one of the critical things um, to appreciate as a scientist is not only do you have to know, you know, your science and your math and, and that, we also have to know how to communicate. You have to know how to write and you have to know how to speak to people and share your ideas because that's how science works. You go, you learn something, you know, you tell other people about it, you discuss it and they go, oh, you revise your ideas and then you think, then you get new ideas and you want to go test that and get more data. That's how the process works. Um, so there is a component where you come home, write up your papers, talk to other scientists about it. Um, and that's how that's how new knowledge um, comes forward. It's the way that, that we do it. Um, and so in addition to doing the science, another part of what we do is figuring out, OK, how are astronauts going to do this work on the moon and on Mars? Because that's the plan for NASA. Um, that's also the plan for commercial companies, you know, looking forward, sending people to the moon and then on to Mars. So what we want to do and what we're doing is trying to figure out, okay, you've got all these constraints, right? You're in a spacesuit. You can only be outside for a certain amount of time because you only have so much air. You can only go so far away from your habitat for safety reasons. You have a limited set of tools, right, to collect your samples and to make your observations. So how do you optimize all of that and get the best and the most science out of having people there on site? So. We do a lot of testing, um, again, a lot of testing in the field, doing it here on Earth. It's cheaper and it's safer. So you might as well work out all the kinks on Earth before you send these things out to space. So we take a lot of different robots and we try to figure out, you know, how can the robots help the people um, when they're in the field? The robots can go before we get there and like map it out and do recon. Robots can help people, you know, carry heavy equipment, you know, while you're in the field, carry your samples back. And then once the people come home to Earth, the robots can stay and they can do follow ups like, oh, we saw this really interesting thing over there, but we didn't have time to investigate it. Send the rover there and send the robot there and go check it out. So we're figuring out how to do all these things. We're also figuring out, you know, like, OK, what's the best way? What's the best equipment the astronaut needs to have? Like how much mobility? Like the astronaut needs to be able to move. The Apollo suits, they were really the ones that the astronauts wore on the moon like really stiff, really bulky. It's really hard to move around. So are there new ways, um, new technologies we can use to make it easier for astronauts to be able to move and bend and look at rocks and that sort of thing? Um, we also look at, you know, how are we going to support the astronauts from the Earth? There are most of the scientists, right? And most of the people operating the mission are, are on Earth. It's only a handful of, of astronauts that are going to the moon or onto Mars. So we will have people in operation centers on Earth, in science backgrounds on Earth, and we need to figure out, OK, you know, what information needs to get sent where and how, right? Because there's limitations in how much information you can send, for example, from the surface of the moon to Earth, right? You can't send all the data you want. We just don't have the communication bandwidth to do that. So how do you optimize all of that infrastructure um, so that we can make sure we get the best and most science out of, out of those um, astronauts? And then we're looking at, you know, the hardware. So you've got an astronaut on the surface of the moon. Um, and then we also have the lander system. So this is the, maybe some of you have heard of it. This is SpaceX's Starship. So this has been selected by NASA for the human landing system to do the first human landing um, on the moon through NASA's new um, Artemis plans. 
And so this is a big spaceship. You can see, if you look down at the bottom, there's like a small person at the bottom. This is a big spaceship um, that will land on the moon. And it's really awesome because we can put all sorts of tools in here. We can collect samples, we can bring rovers, we can do all sorts of interesting things. So we're doing work now to figure out, okay, how's this gonna work? How are we gonna use this? Um, what science are we gonna do? Um, and answer all those questions. So that's pretty exciting um, to be planning out the next missions for when humans are going to the moon. Um, and then just to wrap up and then we'll get into some Q and A cause that's the most fun part. Um, in case any of you like virtual reality, um, maybe some of you have seen it, maybe some of you have used it, um, maybe some of you play games in it, um, we use it for work. Um, so what we do is I actually go out to these field sites, so you can see like on the left, um, we're collecting data in a lava tube. So this is basically an underground tube that was formed from lava that flowed through and now, now is gone. So we, we basically map it out and then we come back to the lab and we render our field sites in VR. And so then I can be in the lab and actually like go back to the field site and make measurements in the field site. In the bottom left, that's the VR scene. So you can see all the rocks, you can see all the textures on the rocks, you can measure the sizes, you can walk around. Um, and so it's, it's a really powerful new technology that we're developing. And you can have more scientists, you know, doing field work without actually having to travel all the way to the field. And maybe you can see where this is going, right? We're figuring out and developing the systems here on Earth in terrestrial field sites, because we want to use this for the moon and Mars too. Right, we're already starting to use like augmented and virtual reality for the Mars rover missions. Right, we have rovers on the surface of Mars right now collecting data. The data gets sent back to Earth. Um, we're not there, people. We are not there. The rovers are there. But in AR and VR, we can put ourselves in the scene and we can make it feel like we're on Mars and we can look around. We can look at the rocks and gives you a, a better appreciation for the site compared to you know looking at just a regular picture. So that's pretty cool. And then there's work going on now too, you know, to make virtual reality mission control centers, for example. Do we all have to like actually sit in the same room? Maybe not. You could probably just do it in VR and then you're, if you're all in the same VR environment, the same VR room. And then on the bottom is a, a VR rendering of, of a mountain range. So you can walk around it. You can like kind of like our VR table. You can walk around, you can see it from different angles. You can spin it, all sorts of things. So there's a lot of cool new technology. And that's also one of the things I like about my job is we get to think about these things. Like how, how can we use this cool new technology to help us do science um, and to do missions on other worlds? So that is pretty fun. Okay, um, I probably have talked long enough. <laughs> so if Joe wants to take over, I'm very happy to talk about anything the students care to ask. All right. That sounds great, Jennifer. Thank you so much for that great presentation uh, and the exciting research that you get to do right here on Earth and how it helps us so much uh, for our future explorations. Before we start meeting some of our classrooms, though, we're going to do a quick Kahoot quiz. So we're going to see how well they were paying attention today, I love it. Uh, what they learned, and then we'll see who comes out on top. So for those who are in the classroom, if you have your own technology, like a tablet or a computer at your desk, you can sign on that way. If uh, you don't, your teacher could put it on at the front of the room and you can shout out the answer as a class. Uh, lots of different ways to take part. So if you head here to this link, kahoot.it, it's gonna ask you for a pin number. And lucky for you, I've got one of those handy. So just bear with me while I share my screen here. I'm gonna do my entire screen, that's easier. There we go. So here we go. Here is our pin number for today. It is 16890. So if you head over there, oh, I can see students joining us already. Excellent. So we'll give them a few seconds to join. If you are paying attention, you should be able to answer all of the questions today. There's 20 seconds on the clock. Right answer, you get points. The faster you put in that right answer, the more points you get. If you put in the wrong answer really fast, well, we got nothing for you. So let's uh, see if we get that right answer in and get it in nice and quickly. So great to see so many students signing in right now. That's great. We'll give you another few seconds. We have five questions today, uh, and then we will go live. I wonder if we're going to hit 100. We're getting close. Ooh. I love the Kahoot quizzes. These are the best. Yeah, it's fun. 
Almost there. We'll give it five more seconds, maybe. Okay, pretty close. Let's okay. jump right into it. The first question. Oh, maybe we are pushing there. Four more. Three, two, one. There we go. All right. Let's get things going. <laughs> so, first question coming up. We've got a nice Halloween background. Very appropriate. So, which NASA facility does Jennifer work at or work for? Was it Goddard Space Flight Center, Jet Propulsion Lab, Johnson Space Center, or was it Ames Space Center? Who remembers which center that Jennifer works for? All right. Whew, close between Johnson and Ames, but a few more students went with uh, AIM Space Center. All right. Taking a quick look at the leaderboard. Ethan S. is holding down the lead by one point. So let's jump right into our next question. What kinds of things are being researched in the field? Was it testing robotics? Was it making spacesuits better for astronauts? Was it learning how we can support astronauts from Earth? Or was it all of the above? What kind of thing with Jennifer and her team do they look at when they're out in the field? There was more than some of these that are listed too. All right, all of the above, good work. And Max has taken the lead. Jumping on to our next question here. Mars is very red because, was it iron in the rocks? Was it, well, we don't know. Is it because it's so dry or was it due to the cold temperatures? Few more seconds to get that answer in. All right, so we did, Jennifer did talk about iron in the rocks similar to Earth. And I visited a real cool island in the Galapagos called Rabida that had a ton of iron in the rocks and the whole island was red, which was really cool uh, to see. Max is still holding down the lead. Let's go to question four. What is an Earth analog? Was it somewhere on Earth the opposite of Mars or the Moon? Somewhere on Earth very similar to Mars or the Moon? Somewhere with life like Earth? Or somewhere humans have already explored? All right, so. Jennifer gets to hang out in really cool places that are very similar to Mars or the moon that we can find on Earth. So very cold, very dry, rocky places like that. And High S is in the lead. Anything can happen with our final question. Here we go. Where has Jennifer not visited to research? The Australian Outback, Antarctica, the Amazon Rainforest, or the Atacama Desert? We definitely talked about three of these. I do not believe one of them came up. All right. Most students went with the Amazon rainforest. We're going to see our final podium here. In third place, Jaden. Second place, we had Max. All right, and I managed to hold first place for the last two questions. Good stuff. Thanks, everyone, for joining in that Kahoot today. I'm going to come back and stop that screen share, and we're going to get into a little Q&A action. There we go. Uh, so is that correct, Jennifer? The Amazon, you have not had the occasion. I imagine there wouldn't be too many sites of too much right. interest in the Amazon. Yeah, I mean, I would love to go there someday, but mm -hmm. for these purposes, it's just too wet. Too wet because um, the moon right. and Mars are very dry, so haven't been to the rainforest. Okay, here we go. Let us grab in some classrooms. Let's get some questions here. Let's start. Let's see. Let's go to Miss Oaks Crew. They're in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Some fourth graders hanging out with us. There they are at the bottom. Hey, fourth graders, how we doing? Hello. Good. 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 All right, we're ready for you. Who's got a question? 
If you found if you find water, it will change your life. But what will you do after that? If I if I find find water on the moon or Mars? Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. I should have addressed this before because this is like, why do we even care? Why are we looking? So there's two answers why I care. So one is we have this question of life in the universe, right? We're on planet Earth and there's lots of life around us. We're alive, there's animals, there's squirrels, there's dogs and bears and trees, grass, all sorts of things, right? We haven't found life anywhere else yet, not in our solar system, not anywhere else in the universe. So one of the biggest questions is, are we alone? Are we the only planet that has life on it or could there be life somewhere else? So one thing we have learned about life on earth is all life on earth needs liquid water. Like we, you have to drink water every day, right? You get dehydrated. Trees need water. All life on earth that we know needs water. So that's why we're looking for water on Mars because we think, okay, if there's going to be life on Mars, it's going to be where that water is or where that water was. So that's one question that's really, really interesting to me. And we call that astrobiology, looking for biology or life beyond the earth. So that's one reason. And a second reason is because when we send people um, to the moon and then on to Mars, um, we want to stay for a long time, right? We want to go and like Mars is really far, so it's hard to get to. And then you get there and you want to be on the surface and you want to explore and live there. And so if we have water that we can use there, that's fantastic because then we don't have to bring all that water from earth right so if we can like if there's ice we can use the water you can use it like to drink and to like take a bath and brush your teeth but also water is h2o water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen and if you break apart the water molecules that makes rocket fuel so now you can use the water that's on mars or on the moon for example to make rocket fuel and make fuel for your base and to, you know, for your habitats and that sort of thing. So if we can use the water, we find enough water and ice, we can use it as a resource to help people be able to stay on the moon and Mars longer and not have to bring everything from earth. So those are the two reasons. All right. Very cool. Two very, very good reasons for why water is so important in those two environments. We're going to grab another question here. Miss Hurley's crew is joining us in London, Ontario. Some fifth graders. I'm going to bring in. I see a student front and center. How are we doing today, fifth graders? Hello. Hi. Good. Hi. Oh, okay. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Great. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. My question is, how much estimated water is there on Mars? Is there a lot or is there very little? That is an excellent question. And you should come work for NASA because we're trying to figure that out. So I'm going to give you two answers. One answer is that when Mars was first born, so all our planets kind of were born at the same time, around four and a half billion years ago is when our solar system was formed. So way back then, billions of years ago, we think that Mars had a lot of water. It had, you know, oceans and rivers and lakes and streams. It had water flowing on the surface. It probably rained. It was kind of like Earth. Mars and Mars and Earth were very similar, like way back then. But then something happened, and that's what we're trying to figure out. Something happened because we know that Earth still has lots of water, right? Lots of water. There's oceans. There's rivers. There's lakes. It rains. It snows. All sorts of water. Mars does not. Something happened and Mars lost most of its water. So today, Mars is very dry. We think that there's a little bit of the water left and it's probably frozen underground. We don't know exactly how much and that's what a lot of our missions that we send are trying to figure out. Where did that water go and how much is left? So we think that the water that's still there, it's not as much as it used to be, so it's a smaller amount, but it's probably underground and there's a little bit in the in the atmosphere. We see like um, some clouds and that sort of thing. There's no rain. There's not enough for rain. Um, but small smaller amount of water today. Lots more water a long time ago on Mars. All right, great question. A future NASA astronaut there yeah. who can answer some of those really important questions. 
So let's take another trip here. Let's go. We've got in Rochester, Minnesota, some fifth graders hanging out with Miss Olson. So I'm going to pop them uh, into the call here. Hey, Miss O's class, how we doing? Hi. Hey, everyone. Uh, what planet will we live on when the Earth explodes? Ah, good question. Well, I would like to reassure you that the Earth is not going to explode. So that's good news. That's very good. I think that the probably the next place we're going to go um, and the next place NASA is planning to go is to the moon. And we're going to go to the moon so we can learn how to live somewhere else besides Earth. Right. We're going to like build rovers and learn to drive them. We're going to build habitats and learn how to live in them. We're going to build spaceships and learn how to land them and launch them. So probably moon first. And then NASA's plans are to, you know, with everything we've learned by going to the moon, then go on to Mars. So then Mars would be next. So I think that's the plan. Moon to Mars. All right. Let's jump to another classroom now. We're going to go to some grade six, sevens. <clears throat> they are joining us in Ontario, in Canada. It's Mr. Richard's class. I'm going to bring them in. I see them there. Hey, six, sevens. How are we doing? Hi. Hello. All Charlie right. has a question for you. Great. What is the most dangerous place you ah. visited on Earth? Oh, good question. I think this answer would be different for everyone. I'll give you my answer. You're in Canada, right? Yes. Yeah. My answer is Canada. <laughs> my answer is the high Canadian Arctic. And you know why? Because there are polar bears there. The polar bears are very dangerous to humans. And when we go to do our field work up really high north in Canada at those islands, you know, super high north, you should know, um, there are polar bears and we're sleeping in tents. There's no hotels, there's no buildings, we are just out there. And so I actually think that that is the most dangerous place that I've been. All right, fair enough. That's a pretty <laughs> good reason. Uh, we're going to bring in Miss Cortez's class. They're joining us from California. It looks like a marine science class. How are we doing today? We're good. Um, my kids are, I'm asking a question for them. Um, they wanted to know if, um, if you've looked into studying Europa, I guess one of Jupiter's moons. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. That's a great question. So Europa is a moon of Jupiter. And so we have very good evidence that Europa is covered in ice, covered in water ice. It's got a water ice shell. And then inside of Europa is most likely a liquid water ocean and a big liquid water ocean. And so Europa is a very important target for the study of astrobiology when we're looking for life in other places in the solar system. And the reason is because of that liquid water ocean that has probably existed for a long amount of time. And so this can help us get to the question of, is there life? anywhere else besides Earth, right? So Mars is a target, Europa is a target, Enceladus is a target too, another moon in the outer solar system, because it's following that theme of look where the water is, follow the water. We got to find places that have water if we want to look for life, which is like life on Earth. So there are missions on the books going to Europa. Europa is tough because it's so far out in the outer solar system, but scientifically it is very, very interesting. So yes. All right. Very cool. Great question. Fairfax, Virginia. Let's bring in our crew there. How are you doing today, everyone? Oh, I, uh, I see the mics unmuted, but for some reason we can't hear you. All right, maybe. Oh, yeah, we got you now. Perfect. Charlie, go ahead. Okay, so we noticed you have your PhD, but like, what specifically is it in? Like, what, what did you like? What was your major in college? Yep, exactly. So I'll tell you, I went. My undergraduate degree is in astrogeophysics, um, and so basically, that's astronomy and physics with geology on top of it. Um, I have a master's degree in space studies, um, so that's looking at science and technology and policy. And then my PhD is in the ge geology department with the planetary sciences division of that. So it's really focused on planetary science. All right, and I think I saw someone else tucked back there. Was there another question? 
There we go. Question. I have actually two questions very quickly. Oh, I think you just hit mute. It just went mute on us. Uh, are you able to unmute for us? Maybe, I don't know if, oh, there we go. I think we got you now. You try again, we didn't get any of the questions. <laughs> oh, sorry, my teacher said that I could not ask that question. She answered it for me. Gotcha, okay then. Fair enough. Uh, okay. Another one, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you talked about uh, Starship landing on the moon and everything like that with car going through. What's the time frame for that? Is that this decade or is that the 2030s? That should be this decade. Should be this decade. Yes. Oh, All right. Very cool. So, uh, Jennifer, we've got a few more minutes. So, I'm going to try and quickly duck into a couple more classrooms and take some of their questions. So, I see someone in Miss Oak's classroom. So, I'm going to bring them in now. Um, is water already on Mars or how does it get there? Sorry, is what on Mars? Is water already on Mars or how is it um, on it? Oh, good question. Good question. So yes, we think that there is water on Mars now. And the way we think it got there is the same way that most of the water in the inner solar system got here. So that includes Mercury, the Earth, Mars. Um, and a lot of that water came from impacts from comets and asteroids. So when the solar system was first forming, it was a big cloud of gas and dust. And then it started to contract on itself and it was spinning around. And then there's like little pieces of dust and rock that started hitting each other and they would collide and sometimes they'd stick and they'd build a bigger rock and then they would keep going and hit more and then some would stick and build a bigger rock and so that's how you build up planets so while all this junk is you know spinning around in our solar system there are a lot of comets and a lot of asteroids that were just bombarding you know our earth the moon mars mercury that's why we have all these impact craters that we see on the moon and mercury and mars um, and so those comets and asteroids, some of them still exist today. There's some in the asteroid belt. There's some far out in the outer solar system. Sometimes comets come through. You can see them in the sky sometimes. Those have a lot of water in them. So that's probably one of the main ways that water got delivered to the inner solar system. And so on Earth, we have all this active geology, right? We have plate tectonics. We have mountains that are being built all the time. We have volcanoes that are erupting. We have lava flows that are happening. We have water and giant oceans, which basically re, um, erases all the evidence of that early geology um, that happened you know, when the earth was first forming. That's why when we look at the moon, the moon doesn't have all that active geology to erase things. You know, there's no liquid water oceans on the moon. There's no atmosphere on the moon, really. There's no wind moving things around. So when you look at the moon, it's covered in impact craters. And that's telling us the history of the early solar system when all this stuff is flying around and just hitting us like crazy and also bringing water in. So it's kind of like a cool detective story um, where we look at the moon and Mars and Mercury and try and figure out what happened way back when to figure out not only how did water come to the moon and Mars and even Mercury, but also how it came to Earth. All right, cool question. Mrs. O's class looks like someone's front and center. There they are. How many layers of dirt are there on Mars, and can the layers of dirt be broken with a drill? I got the last part about a drill. Can can you? It was the question? Can you drill down on Mars and get through the rock and dirt? My question was how many layers? How many layers of dirt? Is there on Mars and can the layers be broken with a drill? Okay, gotcha. So we don't know exactly, and it's probably different in different places on Mars. So in the areas, how many layers there are. So in the areas that we're interested in going to look for the ice in the subsurface, we think it's probably layered like Antarctica is layered in the dry valleys, where you've got a layer of really just dry dirt. And then you hit this, we call it the ice table. It's like you hit this part and then all of a sudden there's ice down below and it gets really hard. So it's kind of like softer dirt on top and then hard ice below. And can you get through with a drill? Yes, yes you can. And this is part of what we do in Antarctica is we have taken drills to Antarctica um, and drilled down so that we can show that we can do it on Earth and then we can do it on Mars. We've sent some, um, some instruments to Mars to get down into the subsurface with varying amounts of success. 
Um, so there are drills that have gone down and we're also sending drills to the moon. There's a drill on Viper, for example, and there's a few others going to the moon. So yes, drilling is a very good way to get underground and see, see what's down there. All right, I wanna pop in Miss Hurley's class. I think I see someone waiting for us there. Do you think the water on Mars is clean and can you drink it? Good question. You should come work at NASA too. That's exactly what we're asking. So we think it'll probably be similar to water, you know, here, like, but if we, we'd have to clean it probably a little bit because if it's like underground and it's got dirt mixed in it, we we'd want to clean the dirt out. And then if it has any other chemicals in it, we'd want to clean that out. So that's one of the things we're actually doing at NASA. We, we create these water cleaning um, devices where you make sure and you can test your water to make sure it's safe, especially if people are going to drink it, right? You want to make sure that it's safe. We do that on earth too, right? You want to make sure your water's clean. Um, you don't want to drink dirty water and get sick or something like that. So yeah, probably we can get the water to be clean and then we can use it to for humans to use, to drink it, to brush your teeth um, or to break it apart and make fuel. So, yep. All right. And Mr. Richard's crew, do you guys have one more question? I think I saw one in the chat. Yeah. Hi. I was just wondering that if we ever do colonize Mars and a colony got in trouble, would you or how would you be able to save it? Yeah, that's a very good question. This is one of the reasons we're planning to practice and test all these things on the moon first, because the moon is only like three days away, right? It's three days to get there in a spaceship, three days to get back. So that's a lot closer than Mars, which on your, in the best case, when Earth and Mars are lined up, is like six months or more. So you have to be much more self-sufficient when you go to Mars, because you're right, you can't just pick up and come home. So what that means is when we're doing the engineering, when we're doing the design, we include a lot of um, safety features and a lot of redundancy. That means like if one thing breaks, um, there's another part like that can take over, right? So everything doesn't kind of fall apart. We we'll also have multiple vehicles on Mars so that if you needed to come back, you could, you could return. Um, so there's a lot of different ways because you're absolutely right. You have to be more self-reliant and take care of yourselves on Mars much more than when you're on the moon um, to get back to your safe haven, which is back to Earth. Mm -hmm. All right. And we managed to visit every class except Miss Cortez's class one more time. So let's see if they have a follow up for us from our marine science crew. We do have one. One second. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Uh, I had a question. Um, why do we stop sending astronauts to the moon? Why do we stop sending astronauts to the moon? That's a great question. I was just writing a paper about this the other day. Um, so for the Apollo program, it ended in the early 1970s. I know none of you were born yet. I wasn't even born yet. Um, and so there were more Apollo missions that were actually planned after that last, that sixth one that landed, um, but they were canceled. And essentially, um, it's a really interesting history because Apollo was a product of the space race, right? Where, you know, we were trying to beat other countries to get into space first as the United States, we wanted to get there first. So that was the impetus to send people to the moon. We did that. And then we proved like, look, the United States, we can do this. We have the technology, like we did it. And so that was the main motivation for doing Apollo. And so once we did that, then there was less incentive to keep um, spending the money and having the risk of sending humans to the moon. And then there were other political factors and other things in the country that kind of took precedence and, and, you know, were of higher priority. And so then the moon landings and the continued Apollo program were not high enough priority. And so those were canceled. And then after that came the shuttle program. So it was because NASA is part of the government, right? NASA is part of the U.S. federal government. Um, there's a lot of political um, considerations that come into it. So um, it's a really very good, interesting case study um, in how these programs work. All right. Well, I want to start out with a big shout out to our YouTube crew. Thank you for sending in some yeah. questions. I'm just going to pop in here for a second. Joe's just wrapping up with another speaker. I don't know if he's chatted with you yet, but... Uh... Okay, uh, a big shout out to our camera classrooms. Thank you for all of the great questions. That was a ton of fun. Uh, and Jennifer, what a cool job you have uh, getting to explore so many places on Earth. 
-hmm. and how that can help us explore off of our planet. I think it's a really exciting time for students. We need a lot of scientists, a lot of engineers, so we can start exploring some of these places. But then there's benefits to us, like the new technology and all kinds of other great things as we learn about our solar system and beyond. Agreed completely. And these are the students who will be going to the moon and Mars and will be making these things happen and bringing these technologies back to Earth to benefit everyone. So it's really, really an exciting time. All right. Well, I am going to let folks in here for a big goodbye and thank you. So here comes the classrooms. So I want to give a big <laughs> shout out. <laughs> Have a great rest of your day.